Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Renu Tyagi from Department of Anthropology, University of Delhi. Today we will be discussing the module Paleopathology from the paper Human Origin and Evolution. The learning objectives of the module are to study the paleopathology of the human remains, to study the background information relevant to the human paleodemography, to study the importance of the human paleopathology. Now let's have an introduction. Paleopathology was defined in 1910 by Sir Mark Armand Ruffler as the science of disease whose existence can be demonstrated on the basis of human and animal remains from ancient times. The study of the paleopathology examines the evolution and progress of the disease through long period of the time and look at how human adapted to the changes in their environment. It provides primary evidences for the state of health of our ancestors and combining the biological and cultural data, that is the biocultural approach. Paleopathology can be considered a subdivision of the biological anthropology and focuses on the abnormal variations in the human remains from the archaeological sites. Primary evidences derived from the skeleton or the mummified remains. This type of evidence is the only reliable indication that a once living person suffered from a health problems. The secondary form of the evidences include documentary and iconographic that is art form data contemporary with the time period under investigation. Paleopathology is an important discipline for the scientific study of the man as it provides background information relevant to the paleodemography, material evidence valuable for the historic as well as prehistoric times of a varying disease spectrum in the past. Evidences of heritable variation in respect of the congenital anomalies due to a genetic basis ranging from the possible single gene differences to the chromosomal abrasions. The frequency of traumatic injury and disease, degenerative joint diseases help us answer questions regarding the antiquity of the disease and its causes. For instance, the study of the skeletal remains of the earlier population of the area help us compare the incidence of the disease in that area today. For example, bone cancer in the present day Tennessee, Alabama and Georgia indication of the disease like the tuberculosis, healed fractures, arthritis and rickets not only inform us about the history of the human disease but can also occasionally help elucidate the cause of certain diseases as well and age progression of the dental decay. It was combined with the paleodemography to obtain a population perspective on health as equilibrium with the disease. Now let's see the development of paleopathology. Paleopathological studies gained great impetus in the second half of the 19th century, the period of the Broca and Virchow. The pathology of a society reflects its general conditions and growth and offers therefore valuable clues to an understanding of the total society. The Order Hede and the Rodriguez Martin in 1998 categorizes the history of the development of paleopathology into four phases that is antecedent Renaissance to mid 19th century, Genesis which is mid 19th century to the first world war, interbellum consolidation phase which is 1913 to 45 and new paleopathology which is 1946 to the present. In the first phase work concentrated mainly on the prehistoric animals but there was recognition that studying the human disease would be beneficial to explore the history of the past human population. At the end of this period the first application of the microscope to examining the Egyptian mummies tissue is noted but there was little scientific precision and the specimens were viewed as the curiosities and not as the source of the medical 
pathological or historical knowledge. The second phase had much more of an anthropological focus and large skeletal collections were available for study. As Orderhead and Rodriguez Martin pointed out, although racial studies were the norm, pathological conditions in these collections were noted, especially by the German physician Rodolf Virchow. Again, it was mainly case studies that were reported and there was little consideration of what the occurrence of the disease meant in epidemiological terms. The French were instrumental from the late 19th century in developing the discipline of the paleopathology. For example, the Paul Broca, who published work particularly on the evidences for Peruvian trepanation. At this time too, the first paleopathology manual was published in America in 1886 by the William Whitney. In the third phase, paleopathology expanded and methods beyond visual that is macroscopic examination were used more often to investigate the pathological lesions and improve the diagnosis in addition to the statistical analysis. This is described as the evolution of the paleopathology as a scientific discipline. Sir Mark Ermond Ruffer promoted the term paleopathology as defining the scientific study of the disease. The final phase is marked by an increased recognition of the link between the paleopathology and epidemiology and demography with much more of a focus on raising the hypothesis and testing them with skeletal data from the large number of individuals. The widely held view that the discipline of paleopathology began in 1774 with the publication of the Asper's account of the lesions seen in some fossil cave bear bone found in the caves in Bavaria takes its origin from the Middle Paleolithic. Various authors who have followed the Moody have perpetuated at least one of the error in the passage from his book. Sarton in his contemporary review of the Moody's book simply repeat more or less verbatim that Moody wrote while Douglas Uberlaker identifies the correct asper and questions the diagnosis of the osteosarcoma but still consider asper's publication as the event that inaugurated paleopathology as a scientific discipline. Now let's have a look at the overview of paleopathology. Though soil type seems to have little influence on the early decomposition of the bone, there is no doubt that different soil have different effect in the long term preservation of the bones. Major pathological changes in the bone may be stimulated by the erosion due to rodent teeth, beetles, plant roots, high winds, etc. Some relatively rare disease but of the characteristics appearance in bone may be confidently diagnosed than many common lesions. Many other killing diseases leave no imprint on the bones. The commonest disease to be found in the ancient bone is the arthritis. Osteoarthritic changes have been reported in Neanderthal men from Shanidar La Chapella Ox scent and Cro-Magnon man. The other most common changes in the ancient bone is no specific inflammation. Paleopathology devoted to the study and diagnosis of disease in ancient human remains provides medical insight on the history and ecology of modern human disease. For instance, childhood illness or malnutrition can be detected by the abnormalities in the tooth enamel and bone mineralization. Many paleopathologists have described the evidence of infection around the middle ear and air sinuses in many culture. Rhodesian men from Broken Hill in Zambia seems to have both dental and the ear infections. Specific infections like the TB are well documented by the ancient remains. There exist skeletal evidences for leprosy, syphilis, poliomyelitis, variety of tumors, osteosarcoma and carcinoma etc. 
the Lengel reported the existence of a correlation between sex and the citrate concentration, individual's biological age and the amount of the calcium, carbonate and collagen contained in the vertebra and the degree of the bone composition and its chemical and micromorphological structure. Anthropologists have been interested in human well-being which is a balance of mankind with the disease parasites and environmental stresses. On the other hand, paleonutrition has two aspects, response of the bone and teeth and the trace element record in the bone. The first healed fracture of the animals as evidenced by the callus are found in the Permian reptiles. A heel fracture was also found in the Neanderthal men, Cro-Magnon men, the European Neolithic and the American pre-Columbian, especially in Peru. The later prevalence might be due to the use of the special weapons like the maces. Numerous arrowheads have been found in the European Neolithic and in pre-Columbian America embedded especially in the vertebra and the extremities. Bone density achieved in the early childhood is the major determinant of the risk of osteoporotic fracture. Up to 60% of the women suffer the osteoporotic fracture as a result of low bone density which is under strong genetic control acting through effects on the bone turnover. This genetic component can be ascribed to a simple allelic change in the receptor for 1 to 5 dihydrovitamin D. One of the hormone which is controlling the calcium metabolism. Irrespective of the molecular, biological or physiological mechanism, Morrison and co-workers in 1994 have identified a gene locus associated with a major part of the strong genetic effect on the bone density and indeed more than half of the adjusted population variation in bone density. This figure displays the osteoarthritis of the patellofemoral compartment of the knee showing marginal osteophyte abomation and fitting on the joint surface as given by Waldron in 2015. Scoring in the direction of movement of the joint is clearly seen on the abernated area. Personification or inflammation was first reported in the Permian reptiles, later in the early mammals and eventually in the Neolithic men. Numerous prehistoric bones lesions have been described as syphilitic, the bone being morphologically stronger. Evidence of the dwarfism Echandroplasty and cretinistic has been found in Egypt in the skeletal and statues. Congenital anomalies of the vertebral column that is spinal bifida and of the sternum have been reported from the Neolithic of Europe and Peru. Next to traumatism, arthritis is the oldest and most widespread pathological lesions reported in paleopathology. Among the hominid, arthritis has been observed all over since Neanderthal men. Chronic arthritis of the hip joint is reported in La Chapella ox sense. Temporomaxillary arthritis in the Crapina men, that is Neanderthal men, Melanesian, Pre-Columbian and New Galadonia. Numerous other joints are affected. Neanderthals, Upper Paleolithic men, Cro-Magnon, Neolithic Europeans and the pre-Columbian Amerindians. This figure shows the rib lesions as seen in the skeleton 187 by the Roberts in 2016 from the Roberts Terry collection in Department of Anthropology, National Museum of Natural History, Washington DC. Spondylitis of the Cervicodorsal and the lumbar region is seen in the La Chapella oxent, Cro-Magnon, European Neolithic, Early Egyptian and the Pre-Columbian American men. A characteristic feature of the spondylitis is the changing seat of the lesion along the vertebral column. For instance, in early men, 
and the primitive lumbar spondylitis is frequent whereas dorsal and the cervical are rare. In modern men, involvement of this is often found. These localization of the pathological areas indicate the places of stress and strain and is also living condition and posture of the individual under reference. Rickets and bone tumor in prehistoric men are generally rare compared to those found in the present day men. Dental pathology was first reported amongst the Neanderthals, Pyria and then among the Neolithic especially in the Scandinavia. This figure shows the rickets in the lower limb long bone of the skeleton which is 3-4 year old given by the Roberts in 2016 from the Coach Lane North Shield, England. Only a small number of disease leave their mark on the bones. However, in mummies, the soft part are preserved to a certain extent. Arteriosclerosis has been observed in the Peruvian mummies while pleurisy, congenital atrophy of the kidneys, gallstones and the liver cirrhosis etc have been demonstrated in the Egyptian mummies. The human skeleton and the mummified remains from pre-contact culture of the new world provide more direct evidences of the disease. Unfortunately, only a few or relatively small number of the disease that affect humans leave any trace of their presence in the skeletons and some disease affect bone in similar ways making an accurate diagnosis difficult. Disease that affects the skeletal are most common long term ailments such as the arthritis, chronic infections and certain dietary deficiencies. Most illnesses that kill the people quickly particularly acute infectious diseases such as influenza, smallpox, typhoid and measles do not leave any of the mark on the skeleton. Paleopathologists are therefore limited to a narrow field of inquiry. Human skeletal remains of 24 individuals from the complex mortuaries 900 BC to 200 BC in La Liberat Guaya province of the Ecuador show artificial cranial deformation, relatively high frequency of the infectious diseases and relatively low frequency of the carious lesions that is 4% and no sign of trauma or the parotic hyperstosis. This suggests that the population had a relatively rapid rate of dental attrition which produced dentin exposure before the age of 20 and loss of most of the crown by the age of 50 years. The estimated mean living Statures of these was 153 cm for female and 170 cm for the males. These are the standards for the adult. Recent studies of the skeletal and the dental stress indicators in the new world remains have shown that health problems were common. Furthermore, morbidity seems to have increased through time in many areas of the new world with increased dependence on the agriculture. For instance, studies of the human remains recovered from the archaeological excavation in Ecuador document that 8000 years ago, population who lived in the coastal Ecuador had low level of infectious diseases, anemia, dental caries and various measures of the nutritional stress. Samples of the human remains from more recent time period in the Ecuador show regular temporal increase in the frequencies of these problems apparently resulting from a more sedentary way of the life and a less varied diet. As populations grew larger and with a shift in the subsistence began to live in more permanent settlement, sanitation problems inevitably developed leading to an increase in the infectious diseases. There are increasing number of cases highly suggestive of the treponymal infections in pre-Columbian New World skeletal remains, yaws, endemic syphilis, venereal syphilis, etc. Population densities probably never reached level necessary to sustain and spread many of the infectious diseases such as influenza, typhoid, measles, smallpox, 
that were common ailments in Europe and West Africa in the late 15th century. Studies of human remains are invaluable for explaining and understanding the human past in as much as the nutrition stress, diet, disease processes, factors affecting mortality and life expectancy, biological responses to the environmental stresses and aging of ancestor is concerned. A major theoretical focus in skeletal research concerns delineation and explanation of human skeletal and dental responses to changing subsistence patterns involved in the transition from hunting and gathering to an agricultural economy based primarily on the corn. Traditionally, this transition has been viewed as a positive additive innovation that provided a dependence, food supply, increased population density and an improved lifestyle. In the light of the recent osteological studies, however, this view requires qualification. Certain hazard accompanied over dependence on this food source. The transition to the agriculture was followed by the increase in the infectious diseases, pre-adult mortality, dental defects, dental caries, cranial pathology and post-cranial periosteal reactions. Skeletal and dental health declined and the individual size and robusticity was reduced. Enamel hypoplasia is discernible as pits or the shallow transverse grooves, especially in the canines and the molar, the tooth is the only slightly affected in most of these cases. This hypoplasia has been reported in Australopithecus crescidens, Arenthropus, Lenthropus capensis, Homo erectus, Pithecanthropus, Pekinensis and Spy 11 Neanderthal men. Hypercementosis is found to be present in the fossil men. Three Neanderthal specimens show some root swelling, for instance, the Gibraltar La Ferrace and the Monsepran Rhodesian men show the beginning of the apical hypercementosis resulting from a low grade infection of the tooth dental caries has been reported in the Australopithecian apes. Earliest example of the well-defined caries have been found in the maxillary 1 and 2 molar of the Australopithecus crescidens. Telenthropus capensis, S. Schul signs of the caries in Homo erectus, Pithecanthropus and 11 carious teeth in the Upper Pleistocene Rhodesian, Upper Paleolithic teeth from the Europe show some evidences of the caries. Mesolithic groups reveal the presence of the carcinogenic factors because of refined carbohydrates, honey and the pulpy plants well before the Neolithic revolution that is cereal cultivation and dietary refinement. Evidences of the periodontal infection is found during the Neanderthal times. Now let's have a look at the Neanderthal men. Many of the vertebrae, especially the cervical of the La Chapelle oxent, exhibit arthritic processes along the margins of their bodies. Odontoid process is abnormally deflected from the medium plane. Articular surface of the alento axial joints exhibit osteoarthritic changes. Other vertebrae are affected by a deforming osteoarthritis. As a consequence, the vertebrae are reduced in height. There also exists a flattening and deformation of the right mandibular condyle. Osteoarthritis of the temporomandibular joint, peculiar flattening of the right condyle. Strauss and Cave in 1953-61 to observed even more severe flattening and deformation in the La Quina and La Ferrace mandibles. Also, obviously, the result of the temporomandibular osteoarthritis. Both these condyles are pathologically distorted. Alveolar border of the La Chapelle skull underwent extensive resorptions during the resulting in loss of most of the teeth ante mortem, result of the prolonged and extensive periodontal diseases. 
Spinal and coaxial osteoarthritis is present in other Neanderthal specimen too. Arthritis is an extremely ancient malady and goes back to the Mesozoic era where it was found in the giant reptiles now extinct. Bone tumor on the Cana mandible may be responsible for the ascription of the Homo sapiens type of chin to this specimen. Angel in 1966 found the growth of the Greek culture between 800 AD and 500 BC connected with such phenomena as an increase in the body size, lifespan and population volume and a decrease in the arthritis, dental pathology, osteoporosis and infant mortality also noticed a decrease in the health after 400 BC. Schulz in 1981 found a higher degree of infestation with the plasmodia, filaria and trypanosoma in the ancestry of the men in view of the biological relationship. Consideration of the domestication process and the cultural dynamic evolved are important but sometimes less attention has been given to the dietary utilization of the resources. What is specially lacking is the consideration of the synergistic effect of the presence of pathogens in animals and humans susceptibility to diseases. Mixed farming and pastoral adaptations have been characteristics of the some areas for significant period of time. Since pathogens and human population have adapted to each other through time, the epidemiological perspective should be productive in this regard. The local and the regional variations in the resources, population distribution, environmental factor affecting the health, nutritional adequacy of the food resources and the nature of the pathogens still must be considered. Skeletal population occasionally lack association with organic archaeological refuse sufficient to permit neat discrimination between stages of the economic change. In a few instances, associated economies are postulated almost entirely from associated artifact and site distribution supplemented by the data from skeletal themselves. Paleopathological studies suffer from the fact that skeletal populations are almost always skewed representative of the living groups and that the skewing may not be the same in any two populations. They suffer from the fact that different analyses have been performed in different regions and often on different population from the same region, making both interregional comparison and interpopulation comparison within a region more difficult. Now let's summarize the module. Paleopathology was defined in 1910 by Sir Mark Armand Ruffel as the signs of the disease whose existence can be demonstrated on the basis of human and animal remains from the ancient times. The study of the paleopathology examines the evolution and the progress of the disease through long period of the time and looks at how the human adapted to the change in their environment. Broadly speaking, it provides the background information relevant to the paleodemography material evidence valuable for the historic as well as the prehistoric times of a varying disease spectrum in the past, evidences of the heritable variation in respect of the congenital anomalies due to a genetic basis ranging from the possible single gene difference to the chromosomal aberrations, the frequency of the traumatic injury and diseases, degenerative joint diseases help us answer the questions regarding the antiquity of the disease and its causes. For instance, the study of the skeletal remains of the earlier population of the area help us compare the incidence of the disease in that area today. For example, bone cancer in the present day Tennessee, Alabama and Georgia indicates the disease like the tuberculosis. Healed fracture, arthritis and rickets not only inform us about the history of the human diseases but can also occasionally help elucidate the causes of certain diseases 
as well as the age progression of the dental decay. It was combined with the paleodemography to obtain a population perspective on the health of the equilibrium with diseases. Thank you.